It's always been hard for people to define just what it means to be a Seattle food. We've never had a single signature dish here, like a Philly cheesesteak or a Maine crab cake. So for the Edible City exhibit, we tried to show just what distinguishes a Seattle food and, and how we got here. Welcoming the Copper River Salmon Runs from Alaska every year is a real Seattle tradition. But what most people don't know is that a former fisherman named John Rowley is the real reason that Copper River Salmon became so famous here. Rowley is just a tastemaker with salmon and with other ingredients. Uh, he helped make fresh fish, something that people expect in Seattle restaurants. He helped popularize other ingredients, things like the shucksum strawberry, which I don't think people really would have heard about without him uh, behind it. And he helped uh, bring the influential visitors like Julia Child to Seattle and help them see how Seattle's ingredients really deserved a wider stage. The coiled baskets from Mohai's archives help tell the story of the foods that were eaten by the Coast Salish peoples. But the real story of what they eat and why is so much broader than what we could tell through artifacts. And we felt it was really a story that their people should tell themselves. So uh, we have a uh, film, we commissioned a film um, telling the story of native food sovereignty as told through the eyes of Valerie Seacrest, a uh, nutrition educator and a member of the Muckleshoot tribe. Seattle's been a center for food-related business almost since it was founded, and it was helped along by its status as a port city close to railways and waterways. Over time, we've evolved from a reputation for canneries and flour mills to one for teriyaki shops and coffee beans. Monorail was the city's first espresso card, and it spawned countless imitators across Seattle and really helped establish our reputation as a center for great coffee. People are always so surprised to hear that the Cinnabon cinnamon roll, the staple of shopping malls almost anywhere you go across the country and across the world, was a Seattle creation. In some ways, the city was just the right size for a project like this. It was small enough that the owners of the restaurant company knew who the best baker in town was, but it was also big enough that they could support a test kitchen where she could spend months upon months in recipe development, baking batch after batch of cinnamon rolls, it had a spice company where they could do a cinnamon school, helping show her what the best kind of cinnamon would be, and eventually it could support franchises around the world. For more than a century, Pipe Place Market has really been known as the soul of our city. And the price tags are, the, are, are changed if you look at the pictures, but the architecture and the character has really stayed remarkably the same. People always think of uh, local food as something that's a very modern creation. But one of our favorite items here is this typewritten letter from 1927, where the market master is yelling at a vendor for selling California spinach when local spinach is available. And they threaten, if it is not out of there, within a certain number of hours, they will confiscate the California spinach and they will destroy it. In the 1960s, there was a proposal for an urban renewal project that would have torn down the market, but the people just rose up. They had a petitions, they got a public vote, and in 1971, then the public voted to indeed save the market and preserve it. Over on the other side of town, you have Wajimaya. When it began, it was really a niche store. It was aimed at Seattle's Japanese population and almost no one else. But as the decades went on, you had changing demographics in our city, and you also had this phenomenon of the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle, where there was a pop-up shop, where people from all backgrounds and all neighborhoods got introduced to Wajimaya. The display includes these original wooden boxes that the founder, Fujimatsu Moriguchi, used in 1928 uh, to steam fish cakes, which he then would sell off the back of his truck. We think about local and seasonal foods as this modern idea, but way back in the 1950s, then Angelo Pellegrini, a Seattle resident, became famous for talking about them. Pellegrini was an immigrant from Italy. He became a University of Washington English professor, and he wrote a book called The Unprejudiced Palate, where he talked about what he called the good life. And it was all about the simple joys and pleasures of eating food that you prepared yourself that you grew in your own garden. The Beacon Food Forest started out as a classroom project. It was actually a final exam. Four students in a permaculture class uh, came up with this idea. 
where they would develop this uh, bare seven acres of land into kind of a community garden where volunteers would plant and weed and anyone who was hungry could come and harvest and eat. After the class was over, people started saying, could we actually turn this into reality? And some people might have thought, no, that's crazy. But here in Seattle, they got a little bit of seed money from the city. They had help from so many volunteers and the food forest is now a working garden. Uh, it, it did become a reality. And I think that's something that's kind of peculiarly Seattle. I don't think this idea would have turned uh, from dream into true garden uh, just anywhere. Seattle is a center for technology and innovation. And over time, that focus has extended out from airplanes and computer coding into food-related technology. For years after it went out of business, homegrocer.com, this online ordering home grocery business, was seen as something of a joke. It was like a punchline about all the excesses and failures of the dot-com era. And now, you look at businesses now, and it becomes clear Home Grocer was just ahead of its time. Allrecipes.com. It was founded in 1997 by this group of University of Washington graduate students and web developers trying to organize their own cookie recipes. They called it cookies.com. Now it's allrecipes.com, and it's one of the world's largest food websites. In addition to all the recipes they have, they have access to these huge uh, data banks of information. And so we asked them, can you tell us what kind of recipes do people from Seattle search for more than people from other areas? And they could. Five of the top 10 recipes involved razor clams. One of them was nettle soup, which did seem very Seattle. And one of them was not just blackberry pie, but wild blackberry pie. A Seattle restaurant tends to feature local, seasonal, and house-made ingredients with some kind of multicultural flair. The other thing we were really struck with when we were thinking about Seattle restaurants um, was the fleeting nature of fame. And it was really hard to put our fingers on why does a restaurant, um, how does it stay relevant, how does it stay stay a Seattle restaurant as times change around it. If there's one restaurant that managed to unlock the secret, it was this one. It opened up as the Canless Broiler in 1950, back when a charcoal broiler was a fancy restaurant. And yet times changed and Canless changed right along with them. So that's a quick overview of an exhibit that took two years of on and off planning, a deep dive through Mo Hive's enormous archives, um, some really generous loans from people all around in the community, and this collaboration with this cross-section of Mo Hive staff members. People had to learn how to clean oyster shells, how to hang wallpaper, how to recreate a booth from a famous restaurant. And I think hardest of all, they had to figure out how do you get across the essence of food in this space where by its nature food is strictly forbidden.